All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Just have a few items at the top, and then I'll get right to your questions. Uh, first, on a topic that I know all of you are following closely, the Department of Defense continues to closely monitor the situation in the Middle East. As you've heard Secretary Austin say, the U.S. remains intensely focused on de-escalating tensions in the region, while also remaining focused on securing a ceasefire as part of a hostage deal to bring all of the hostages home and to end the war in Gaza. Now, during a phone call on Sunday to Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, the Secretary reiterated the United States' commitment to take every possible step to defend Israel and noted the strengthening of U.S. military force posture and capabilities throughout the Middle East in light of escalating regional tensions. Reinforcing this commitment, Secretary Austin ordered the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group, equipped with F-35C fighters, to accelerate its transit to the Central Command Area of Responsibility, adding to the capabilities already provided by the USS Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group. Additionally, the Secretary ordered the USS Georgia Guided Missile Submarine to the Central Command Region. These U.S. military force posture adjustments are designed to improve U.S. force protection to increase our support for the defense of Israel and to ensure the United States is prepared to respond to a wide variety of contingencies. During their call, Secretary Austin and Minister Gallant also discussed Israel's operations in Gaza and the importance of mitigating civilian harm, progress towards securing a ceasefire and the release of hostages held in Gaza, and our efforts to deter aggression by Iran, Lebanese Hezbollah, and other Iran-aligned groups across the region. Switching gears, Secretary Austin hosted Brunei's Minister of Defense, Penin Halbi, here at the Pentagon earlier today. They discussed the defense partnership between our two nations and celebrated the finalization of key agreements to enhance logistics and security assistance. Both leaders emphasized their commitment to strengthening U.S.-Brunei ties, and to supporting their shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. A readout of the meeting will be posted to defense.gov later today. And finally, the department announced yesterday the launch of the DOD Housing Feedback System, an initiative designed to enhance transparency and accountability in DOD privatized military housing. The system opens an additional high visibility communication channel for active duty service members and their authorized dependents living in privatized military housing to submit public feedback related to the condition of their current housing unit and to receive a response from their privatized landlord. The system is intended to augment, not replace, existing processes for submitting maintenance work order requests. Privatized military housing residents should continue to submit work order requests through their community's property manager or other regular channels to receive corrective action for maintenance issues. The Department of Defense has a moral obligation to ensure that the spaces where our service members and their families live are healthy, functional, and resilient. This new feedback system is a critical step to ensuring transparent and timely responses to occupants' concerns and aligns with Secretary Austin's priority to take care of our people. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. We'll start with Associated Press, Lita. Thank you, Pat. Um, can you give us a quick update on the injuries in Syria? Um, there weren't a lot of details initially. I was sort of hoping you had a bit more detail on numbers and extent of the injuries, and then I have a couple little um, up on your Middle East update. Sure. Uh, as you know, uh, as we highlighted earlier, there were ongoing medical evaluations uh, after that attack. Following the attack, out of, out of an abundance of caution, eight service members were transported to a separate location for further assessment and evaluation. All eight received treatment for TBI and smoke inhalation. Uh, three of those service members have returned to duty while the others remain under observation. Uh, but according to CENTCOM, none of the injuries are life-threatening. Okay, okay. And then just on your Middle East update, uh, can you tell us if the FA-18s have returned to the carrier now that the F-22s are in place? And uh, do you, does the Secretary intend to keep two carriers? I know this has been asked, I didn't know if maybe you had a more firm answer on that. Keep two carriers in the region for any extended period of time. Yeah, I don't have any specific updates uh, that I'm able to share right now, Lita, in terms of the, the locations of the F-18s. As you know, they, they are in theater, obviously, uh, as part of the, the uh, 
Theodore Roosevelt strike group. Um, certainly will keep you updated on that. Um, in terms of the uh, Abe coming into the AOR, I'm just not going to be able to get into timelines in terms of potential overlap. Um, you know, again, uh, as we've highlighted, the secretary has ordered that carrier to accelerate uh, to get to the CENTCOM AOR, uh, and it will add to the capabilities that we have in the region. Right. I think there's just a little bit of confusion on the word accelerate also. I mean, it goes at a certain speed. Is, is he cutting out a port call, or is he asking it to somehow go faster? It's going to move, uh, you know, w with all haste to, to get to the AOR, again, to provide this uh, additional capability and capacity. Okay. Lucas, welcome General, to the briefing room. <laughs> Thank you, General Ryder. Appreciate that. Under what circumstances would U.S. forces launch an attack on Iran? So, look, our focus is on de-escalating the situation. Uh, we have put these additional capabilities into the region to enable us, as I highlighted, to protect our forces, but also to support the defense of Israel should it be attacked. I'm not going to speculate or get into hypotheticals on when and if Iran launches an attack or, or one of their proxies launches an attack. Their public comments have been very clear, so we need to take those seriously. But our focus is on de-escalating tensions, uh, working on enabling that ceasefire and getting these hostages returned home. But isn't it important at this critical time in history that you send a very clear signal to Iran that if they attack, launch a major attack on Israel and or its proxies, the U.S. military will attack Iran. Don't you need to send a clear signal about what Iran, if they do it, if they cross it, you will attack them? I think we are sending an extremely clear signal, which is that we are going to support the defense of Israel as evidenced by the capabilities that, one, we already retain in the region, and two, the additional capabilities that we're flowing into the CENTCOM and UCOM AOR. Real quick on Lincoln. The Secretary has ordered Lincoln to the Middle East twice now in the past in over 10 days. The first time was two days after the Hamas leader was killed outside in Tehran. The second time was on Sunday, as you mentioned. Uh, if the, the, where was the sense of urgency for Lincoln to get to the Middle East? Uh, Lincoln was just doing an exercise with the Italian Navy on Friday. If it was so urgent for Lincoln to get to the Middle East, why did you need the second set of orders? Well, Lucas, as a formal former naval officer yourself, you, you understand the complexities uh, and intricacies associated with managements of large fleets around the world. And the bottom line is, again, as evidenced by the capabilities that we are surging into the region, uh, we will have a variety of capacity and capability to respond to various uh, contingencies. Again, the focus is on de-escalating the situation, protecting our forces, and supporting the defense of Israel. And we'll continue. And this is not a Lucas Tomlinson press conference, so I'm going to go over to Idris. If you do this, launch this major attack, the U.S. military will strike back. Why can't you just clearly say that? I think we've been very clear that we're going to support the defense of Israel, and I'm not going to speculate about potential future attacks by Iran. Idris. Just a request first. I think Task and Purpose had an interview with General Vowell, um, OIR commander. If it would be possible to get him in the briefing room or maybe General Kurla to sort of talk about the force posture adjustment, I think that'd be great. got to get the T-walls set up, though, first before we can do that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just on the Lincoln, though, was there a written order given to the crew of the Lincoln um, regarding the latest ordering or accelerating? Look, I'm not going to get into the specifics of how the Department of Defense transmit orders to its units. The bottom line is the Secretary has ordered the USS Abraham Lincoln Carrier Strike Group to accelerate its uh, deployment to the CENTCOM AOR, and I'm just going to leave it at that. I guess I think what we're confused about is what does that mean? Because if you, say, if you give an order saying going somewhere, presumably they're going as fast as they can. And what it sounds like is maybe this was more public messaging than an actual legitimate military order. It's a legitimate military order, and it's accelerating uh, on its mission to get to the CENTCOM AOR. And uh, again, I'm not going to get into the, the in-between of when the uh, initial order was given and what they may or may not have been doing in between then, other than to say, again, I think you need to take a step back and look at what we're attempting to do here, which is to, to de-escalate tensions in the region, ensure that our commanders that are in the region have the capabilities and capacity to respond to a variety of threats. Actually, say it is now going to arrive in CENTCOM earlier than it was, 
previously. Yeah, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get into the specifics of the deployment timelines. It's, like the confusion it's causing, right? I, it's not confusing to me. It's accelerating. So, yes, sir. Thank you, General. Mm -hmm. Would it be a fair assessment to say that Israel cannot defend itself on its own and that's why they need the U.S. military support in the region against Iran and its proxies? Well, the U.S. and Israel have shared a long-standing security relationship and we've been very clear even before October 7 on uh, the U.S. support for Israel supporting its qualitative military edge, uh, but also post October 7 have been very, very um, clear in terms of our ironclad support for the defense of Israel. And so, as you saw on April 13, when Iran conducted its unprecedented attack, the United States, uh, true to its word, supported the defense of Israel. Just one more, so is this a just in case situation or is this military support indispensable because you've got the F-35s, F-22s, F-18s, 16s, 15s, the warships, the air defense systems, the troops, everything like you know, the whole nine yards. Is this just in case or indispensable? Well, again, I'd go back to what I said at the top. And I think it's important not to look at the individual parts, but look at what it is that we're trying to do here, which is deter a wider regional conflict, prevent a regional war, in a very tense Middle East uh, with Iran threatening to retaliate uh, and to use potentially overwhelming force. And we, again, have been very clear in our commitment to aid in the defense of Israel. No one wants to see escalation. No one wants to see a wider regional conflict. So, you know, hopefully you don't find ourselves in a situation of having to employ those capabilities. Uh, but if we need to in the defense of Israel, we will. And so just leave it there. Charlie. Yes. Um, whatever term we want to use in terms of accelerating, it's still going to take a while, seven to ten days. I know you want to talk about timelines, but perhaps more urgently and something that's already in the neighborhood is the submarine. The fact that it was announced, mm -hmm. what does it bring to this fight? Uh, this, you know, it's a nuclear powered guided missile submarine. Uh, provides, again, additional capabilities to the commanders, the U.S. commanders in the region in terms of not only uh, supporting the defense of Israel, but also protecting our forces. Um, and again, the message here is deterring potential aggression. Uh, it's not unprecedented that we will highlight the movement of submarines. Um, but again, it's important to look at this in the context of the broader U.S. military force posture in the region, which is to help protect our forces, support the defense of Israel, and again, deter aggression and aim to de-escalate the situation. They're capable of carrying as many as 175 Tomahawk cruise missiles? Look, the United States military is the most powerful in the world. Uh, we have these capabilities. And again, uh, I'm not going to belabor the point, but the, the goal here is to de-escalate the situation and ensure that we can support the defense of Israel should we need to do that. Jenny. Thank you, General. Two questions uh, on the establishment <coughs> of the strategic command. Does the Pentagon support the completion of the establishment of the South Korean military strategic command? And uh, I have another. And can we expect the establishment of the U.S. ROK integrated uh, strategic command? Uh, well, you know, certainly that's a decision for the Republic of Korea to make uh, to determine whether or not they stand up a, a strategic command. Um, as it relates to that new organization, as I understand it, uh, it will primarily interact with U.S. forces Korea, which is how the U.S. military interacts with the Republic of Korea. But, but as you know, we are close allies and we will continue to work together very closely when it comes to the defense of the peninsula and broader, broader regional security and stability throughout the Indo-Pacific. One more. Uh, North Korea attended Russia's uh, defensive uh, weapons exhibition and uh, Iran and China also uh, are participating in this exhibition. What are your concerns about the expansion of uh, arms cooperation between North Korea and Russia and the cooperation between Iran and China with Russia? Well, you know, look, I'm not going to comment on the, the weapons expo per se, but 
we again closely monitor these relationships and do have concerns, particularly as it relates to Russia, uh, as it seeks to uh, procure arms and munitions from these countries to support its war against Ukraine. Uh, so it's something that we're going to continue to keep a close eye on. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you, General. Two questions on Syria. Uh, there were reports about a drone attack on the Iranian back groups in Syria, which a war monitor reported that five members of this pro Iranian <coughs> militia killed in Deir al Sur this Sunday. Uh, were the U.S. engaged in this? I, I don't have anything on that. On, on the same issue, uh, I'm sure you're following the, the, the conflicts between Syrian Democratic Forces and the Iranian backed groups in Syria. So, what's the Pentagon position on, on this? What's your comment on that? And does the U.S. support, gives any support to the Syrian Democratic Forces in their fight against the Iranian backed groups in Syria? Look, the, the U.S. Uh, forces that are in Syria and our focus in Syria is on the uh, enduring defeat of ISIS, and that will continue to remain our fo focus. As you know, the SDF have been good partners in that fight, essential partners in that fight, uh, and that continues to be the, the basis for our relationship and our cooperation with the SDF. Their fight with the Iranian-backed groups in Syria, they, they derailed their focus on the ISIS mission. So do you concern when the Syrian regime forces and also the Iranian-backed forces are fighting with your partners, this will affect your mission in Syria? Well, look, I mean, Syria, given the fact that much of it is uh, essentially considered ungoverned space, you know, f for, for many years now, which is what has enabled groups like ISIS to, to foment, um, continues to be a challenge. But the U.S. presence in Syria and our focus in Syria is on the enduring defeat of ISIS, and so that will continue to remain our focus. Let me go back to Jerry. Thank you, General Reiser. <coughs> when, when you say uh, we're moving assets to the region to defend Israel, could you explain to us that using the term defend Israel, is, is, does it mean like the mission or the, the U.S. role in the region would be intercepting the incoming missiles or maybe taking offensive actions? Could you emphasize on that? Yeah, look, it, it hasn't changed uh, since... Uh, Hamas's attack on October 7th in terms of the role that the United States has played in supporting the defense of Israel. We are not looking, the United States is not looking to uh, to engage in offensive operations and, and um, again, potentially spark a wider regional conflict. Our focus is on de-escalating tensions, and that's been a focus ever since Hamas brutally killed 1,200 uh, Israeli citizens and took over 250 hostages. And so we will continue to stay very focused on that. But as what you saw on April 13th when Iran conducted its missile and drone attack against Israel demonstrated uh, the types of activities that, that Iran is considering. Uh, and we've been very clear that our support for the defense of Israel will be ironclad. And so we need to be prepared to respond to a variety of contingencies, which requires a variety of capabilities. Uh, and because the United States military possesses those types of capabilities, and more importantly, uh, our service members are the best in the world, uh, we will continue to stay focused on uh, not only, again, protecting our forces, but supporting our commitment to help in the defense of Israel. Great. Follow up. Does the Pentagon believe that the deterrence is working in the region? Uh, so far, Joe, what I would tell you is that the, you know, it's our assessment that the conflict between Israel and Hamas has been contained to Gaza. Certainly, that's not to say that there are not incredible tensions in the region. Uh, and that the situation right now in the Middle East is very serious, which is why we're taking it so seriously, which is why Secretary Austin has ordered additional capabilities into the region. Thank you. Joe. Thanks. Um, <coughs> yesterday, the White House <coughs> said that an attack, an Iranian attack or retaliation could come within days or this week. Um, and then, so one, do you share this assessment? But then two, when asked, if Iran or some of its proxies, including uh, Hezbollah and Lebanon, have moved any of their assets or put certain uh, rockets, missiles, drones into position, or if they've moved those into position to attack, we refer to the Pentagon. So have you guys seen any movement? 
Yeah, and your second question, I'm just not going to get into intelligence on on what we may be seeing. Uh, on your first question, is an attack possible this week? That's certainly possible. Um, the bottom line is, you know, I'm not going to speculate or, or try to guess when they might attack. Um, other than to say we need to take it seriously, uh, and we are doing that. And so we will be prepared uh, and are prepared. Second, um, on the attacks on U.S. troops, we've seen several in the last few weeks, but in two separate attacks, troops have been injured or wounded. Um, we have not seen a U.S. response. Is that is, is part of the reasoning for that because of the tense situation in the Middle East that you've mentioned uh, during this briefing? or? Has the, has the U.S. decided not to respond to these? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll repeat what Secretary Austin said during his press briefing last, last week, which is that we won't tolerate attacks against our forces and we'll take all necessary steps to protect our forces. But in terms of a, a response, um, as always, we will respond in a time and manner of our choosing. And I'll just leave it at that. Is the situation, current situation, is that being taken into account by the department? Look, I'm not going to have anything to provide beyond what I just said. Carla. Thanks, Pat. Um, is USS Georgia in CENTCOM now? Um, it is not. Okay. And then on the attacks in Syria um, on Rubalan landing zone, who is responsible for those attacks? So we assess uh, that it was conducted by Iranian-backed militia, but we're still uh, digging into the, uh, the specifics of that. So, thank you. Let me go to the phone here real quick. Chris Gordon, Aaron Space. Uh, thanks, Pat. Um, Abraham Lincoln is headed to CENTCOM from the Pacific. The Theodore Roosevelt uh, was previously in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the flare-up in the Middle East has now gone on in some form for most of a year. Is the DOD appropriately postured for tensions in the Pacific and the Middle East uh, over the long term? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Uh, you know, the bottom line is yes. Um, the, the thing about the U.S. military, as you're seeing this week, is that we have the ability to surge forces and capabilities to where we need them, when we need them. Uh, the the Indo-Pacific Command uh, continues to be our priority theater, uh, and uh, that is uh, indicative, indic indicative of the number of forces that we have uh, that are located within the region. Uh, and so, again, we're going to move uh, forces where we need them, when we need them. But I can tell you and uh, you know, be rest assured that the Indo-Pacific uh, has a significant number of U.S. forces to support our commitments uh, toward that end. Thank you. Let me go to uh, Heather, USNI. A similar question, but um, focus on the Middle East. With the fact that the TR is going to take at least probably around two weeks to get to the Middle East, does the United States feel confident? with the amount of resources that they have in the Middle East if Iran were to attack uh, it before TR gets there? Uh, do you mean the Abraham? Sorry, yes, Abraham. I mean, again, we already maintain a significant amount of uh, capabilities uh, within the U.S. Central Command and European Command regions. Uh, and so uh, these additive capabilities will just uh, make that more robust. Okay, let me come back to the room. Orrin. What, why isn't the U.S.'s Georgia in CENTCOM yet? It was in the med, so it's certainly within range to have gotten a CENTCOM. Already. I'm not going to get into the specifics of, of its location uh, and timelines. Again, it has been ordered to the Central Command uh, area of responsibility. Sir. Thank you so much, uh, General. I have a question on Afghanistan. In two days from now, it's going to be the third anniversary of a U.S. complete withdrawal from Afghanistan and the fall of a previous government. General, what is the assessment of Pentagon after three years over Afghanistan? <coughs> is the ISIS-K and also the Taliban or some faction of the Taliban like Haqqanis are a threat to the national security of uh, the United States or not? Um, so just to make sure I clarify, uh, you're asking about the terrorist threat emanating yes. from yes. Afghanistan? Yes. Uh, well, you know, it's definitely something that we continue to, to keep a close eye on. Uh, you have uh, various terrorist groups which operate in and around Afghanistan to include ISIS-K. Um, and so we maintain a variety of capabilities to include over-the-horizon uh, capabilities should we need to do that. Um, but 
I think most importantly is we'll continue to work with our partners in the region when it comes to addressing terrorism uh, through our mutual counterterrorism efforts. One Iran question. So the Israeli uh, officials said that they will attack inside Iran if Iran uh, does any um, uh, uh, re retaliate any any form and, and, and way. So does the United States support that, that the Israeli will attack inside Iran if Iran does anything? Well, look, again, I don't want to get into hypotheticals at this stage. Right now, our focus is on de-escalating tensions in the region. So Any progress on de-escalating? There hasn't been a conflict yet, so we'll stay after it. All right. Sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, the co the counterterrorism chief of United Nations uh, said that Europe is facing a big threat from ISISK. He also mentioned that the same group was involved in terrorizing the Taylor Swift concerts in Vienna last week. Um, all these terrorists are based in Afghanistan. Uh, is it a concern because they're also involved in the attacks on Pakistani security forces? What kind of measures are being taken to prevent the expansion of this terror group? Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> as evidenced by the global coalition uh, to defeat ISIS, it, it does remain a threat. Uh, and you've seen the United States work very closely with many nations around the world to address ISIS, whether it's uh, in Europe, Asia, uh, and also, as you know, you've seen in uh, Iraq and Syria. Uh, and there's also manifestations of ISIS in, in the African continent. So we're, we'll continue to work with our partners and allies around the world to address the ISIS threat wherever we see it. The Pakistani security forces that I stated, uh, the senior Al-Qaeda leader, uh, recently moved from Afghanistan to Pakistan. Pakistani investigators claim that this terrorist was a close associate of his founder, Osama bin Laden. Is it a concern that Al-Qaeda is also gaining strength in Afghanistan? Uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, as you know, has been uh, greatly diminished over the years, but is not gone. Uh, and so, again, similarly to ISIS-K and, and other groups that present a potential security threat to the United States and our allies and partners will continue to stay very focused on addressing that threat. Let me take uh, just another one from the phone here, Jared from El Monitor. Hi, Pat. Um, it seems uh, Iran and Hezbollah, if they are going to, uh, you know, to stage a retaliation, they obviously haven't done so yet. Um, wondering if uh, you can attribute that to anything. I mean, does the department have any reason to believe that this is a part of their uh, retaliation or that, you know, the uh, plus ups of, of assets, U.S. assets in the region may be uh, causing uh, some second thoughts there? Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Jared. I mean, that's really a question uh, for Iran to answer. Uh, I can tell you again what our focus is and on what we're doing, and it's working very hard uh, with our uh, partners in the interagency uh, and our regional partners to de-escalate the situation uh, and deter potential aggression. Okay, take a couple more. Let me get to Louis. Thank you. Um, blast from the past here, j -Lot's question. Um, there was some aid that was awaiting transport um, into the Gaza area before the JLUX mission ended. Um, has, well, uh, maybe I'm premature in saying it's ended. Um, has that aid been delivered and what is the status of the coordination cell uh, if that is the case? So uh, what I'm tracking Louis right now is that uh, the motor vessel Cape Trinity has uh, approximately 6 million pounds of aid on it, currently in Cyprus awaiting movement to Ashdod. Uh, and um, so that, you know, as we've said before, that those uh, that vessel or some of those vessels would participate in helping to deliver some of the final aid from Cyprus into, uh, into Israel en route to Gaza. Um, yeah, so... So does that mean that there is more aid still in Cyprus, no. or is this is it? This no, that's is, it. This is the this last. Is my, my understanding is that. It. Now, of course, uh, I, I would commend you to talk to USAID about the broader humanitarian aid deliveries. But as I understand it, um, that's the the remainder of the aid. And then what happens now with the U.S. coordination cell under General Frank that was there? Um, does it still remain active? Um, will it continue uh, to enable a more a different kind of maritime corridor? Yeah, so, so my understanding is that uh, CENTCOM will continue to support uh, in an advisory capacity some of the, the best practices that were developed during the, the JLOTS uh, operation to include the Convoy Management Board as a way to help ensure that 
uh, things are, are being moved. But certainly from a, a from a DOD U.S. military standpoint, I mean, you know, the, the vast majority of that has now uh, relocated or is in the process of relocating to the states uh, because, of course, JLOTS has stood down. Thank okay, you. thanks. Let me try to get to a couple other folks here that haven't got to. Jim. Hey, General, just a quick question on Ukraine. Can you give a lay down on, on what the U.S. thinking is on the offensive that the Ukrainians have launched? And uh, do you think that's, is that is that meant to be a permanent sort of uh, operation or is that a raid? Yeah, Jim. So on that, I mean, that's really something for the Ukrainians to talk to. I'd refer you to them to talk about their operations. You know, we are we are in contact with our Ukrainian counterparts uh, to to get additional details in terms of their uh, objectives as it relates to to their uh, operation. But I don't have anything beyond that. Thanks, sir. Uh, thank you, General Pat. So on an Alba Assad airbase in Iraq. Uh, as you know, the base has been targeted multiple times by Iranian proxies uh, since last year and resulted in uh, like damages and harm to U.S. personnel. So does the base have sophisticated air system and capabilities to intercept the missiles and drones? So as I'm sure you can appreciate, I won't go into the specifics of exactly what we have in terms of air defense or, or uh, facility defense capabilities uh, other than to say that that's something we take incredibly seriously uh, and are constantly assessing those capabilities and ensuring that we're doing everything we can to protect our forces. That's not to say though, uh, and, and history has shown this, that our forces often operate in harm's way and do in dangerous places uh, and, and that's why they are trained, that's why we ask them to serve in uniform. Uh, and as evidenced by their performance, uh, they do brilliant and important work every single day uh, in defense of our nation. So we're going to do everything we can to ensure uh, that they have the best when it comes to uh, force protection. Uh, one more, if you don't mind. Have your diplomatic efforts to persuade or stop Iran from launching strikes had any result? I mean, did you receive any messages from Iran directly or indirectly? Yeah, I don't have anything to provide on that. He had. You said the secretary takes every possible step. He will take every possible. Secretary Austin will take every possible step to defend Israel. Does that include taking offensive strikes against Iran? Look again. We are focused on supporting the defense of Israel, de-escalating the situation, and preventing a broader conflict. I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Uh, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. Rule what out taking strikes against Iran. You're saying the U.S. taking preemptive strikes? Pre if Israel is attacked in a major So you're way. getting into hypotheticals. You started it with if, and I'm going to not get into hypotheticals. So there you go. Thanks. To be clear to Brad, I, I think we're being pretty clear, Lucas. You we're sending significant... Camera, being I'm being Iran very Iran? clear to Lucas and Iran. <laughs> that we are sending significant capabilities in the region to protect our forces and support the defense of Israel and respond to a wide variety of contingencies. If you look at the strategic goal here, it's to de-escalate the situation and prevent a wider regional war. And that requires diplomacy, it requires military force presence, and it requires uh, being smart about how we go about doing this. We're not seeking conflict, we don't want conflict. But we're going to do what we need to do to support the defense of Israel and support the protection of our forces. But again, the underlying message here is we're working to de-escalate tensions. No one wants a wider war. Brad. Thank you. So, um, on Ukraine, can you say if Russia has redeployed troops from the front lines of eastern Ukraine to defend its borders in Kursk? And is, if so, is it a significant number of troops? Yeah, I don't, I don't have anything to provide on that uh, from the podium here, Brad. You know, again, I'd refer you to the Russian MOD. It's something that we're keeping an eye on. You know, our focus at the end of the day when it comes to Ukraine is supporting Ukraine and its ability to defend its sovereign territory uh, and to take back sovereign territory uh, within Ukraine. Thanks. 
time for just a couple more to go charlie and then i'll come to you yes sir thank you general uh changing the topic entirely uh we're following the story about this defense department contractor who's arrested with a ton of classified documents stolen from this building could you shed some light on that seen the the press reports on that but i need to refer you to the department of justice for any questions on that you can't tell me how serious this breach is yeah i i really just don't have anything to provide from here uh, i'd have to refer you to doj okay last question yes sir general um you mentioned uh, several times uh, your message that you are looking to de-escalate the tensions in the region so my question what we are seeing right now with the militaries uh, increasing in several parties do you believe that diplomatic solution is still possible? Um, and uh, um, do you think that the parties were listening? And what's your message to them? You know, look, um, there is always time for diplomacy to work. And that will continue to be the main effort, uh, certainly for the United States government, in terms of working to de-escalate the situation, implement a ceasefire, and get the hostages home. So as long as there's hope, and there is, we'll continue to stay focused toward that end. Um, and then, I'm sorry, your second question? My second question is going to be another uh, topic, please, uh, sure, with mine. Um, uh, there is some reports claiming that the weapon that been used to attack al tabi'in school in Gaza recently was a U.S. bomb, a U.S. made bomb. Do you confirm uh, that, uh, General, and uh, do you believe that Israel is still using the U.S. weapons according to U.S. and international law? Yeah, when it, when it comes to uh, Israeli employment of munitions, I'd have to refer you to them. I, I don't have any information to provide. Uh, in terms of civilian casualties, as I highlighted at the top, uh, this is something that we continue to take very seriously. It's something that Secretary Austin has discussed with his Israeli counterpart every single time they talk, uh, highlighting the importance and the moral imperative uh, and the strategic imperative of ensuring that civilian safety and harm mitigation is taken into account in conducting operations. The bottom line is, way too many civilians have died during this conflict, both Palestinian and Israelis. And so it's, it's incredibly important that Israel continue to conduct its operations in a way, um, plan its operations in a way that is taking civilian uh, safety into account. That's not to say, though, uh, that Hamas doesn't bear responsibility as well in the fact that they conduct their operations uh, and embed their forces amongst the civilian population in places like schools, mosques, hospitals, making it incredibly difficult uh, for Israel to conduct its operations in these areas. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Just a quick yeah. clarification on the Louis question. That six million in, uh, pounds that's on the, I think, Cape Trinity, is that part of that 20 million tons that you all keep talking about, or is that in addition to it? Uh, I believe the the aid that was delivered previously. Correct. Is this would be in addition okay, to. Okay, so this is in addition to that. Okay. Correct. Thank Correct. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.